One by one, I will introduce them and bring them out to begin our conversation. Our first panelist is Associate Vice President and Dean of Washington Programs for Hillsdale College and author of the book, We Still Hold These Truths. He's also Executive Editor of the Heritage Foundation Guide to the Constitution. Please welcome Dr. Matthew Spaulding. Our next panelist is Editor-in-Chief of Reason Magazine, co-host of The Independence with a TS on the Fox Business Channel, and co-author with Nick Gillespie of the book, The Declaration of Independence, again with a TS, How Libertarian Politics Can Fix What's Wrong with America, and we need that. Please welcome Matt Welch. He is the host of Talkers Magazine's Top 10 Political Talk Shows, reaching an audience of 4.7 million and a best-selling author. From the Salem Radio Network, please welcome Michael Medved. And finally, he's president and founder of Students for Liberty with now over 1,200 local groups. Last year, he led 40 conferences on five continents for 5,000 students, and in his spare time, he's a graduate student at George Washington University. Please welcome Alexander McCobin. That's something different, but we got into it, something like that. We've done it for a while. Hey, am I Alex Trebek or what? This is great. <laughs> oh, if you want to join the conversation, at CPAC News, hashtag Minery Panel. <laughs> All right, Alexander, the first question to you, you heard my introduction, and tell me what I got wrong here. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for that introduction. I do think the question even started off on a false premise that all libertarians are associated with the Libertarian Party. That's not the case. You can be a libertarian and not be a Libertarian Party member or not be a libertine. Libertarianism doesn't even require someone to adopt certain policy positions or a particular justification for political philosophy. You're able to be a Republican, a Democrat, an Independent, and be a Libertarian. You can be a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew, or an atheist, or any other religion and be Libertarian. What it means to be Libertarian is to be committed to a certain approach to political philosophy, where the principle of liberty is the most important. And what's important to keep in mind with this is that there's a difference between a political philosophy and a personal lifestyle. You can be a social conservative and be a libertarian when it comes to public pol policy. The important difference being what you think the government ought to mandate for individuals. Just because you think people ought to act a certain way doesn't mean you want the government to require them to be that, whether you're talking about banning big gulps or banning certain kinds of marriage. In fact, I think social conservatism relies upon the freedom to choose what to do here. If you take John Locke's A Letter Concerning Toleration seriously, the only way for people to act morally is to have the freedom to choose what they're going to do. And we see many social conservatives today recognizing this, whether we're talking about same-sex marriage or marijuana legalization. Here's a quick list of social conservatives who support these things. For same-sex marriage, Glenn Beck, Dick Cheney, Megan McCain, Laura Bush, Governor John Huntsman, Congressman Tom Ridge, current Senators Rob Portman, Mark Kirk, and Lisa Murawski. When it comes to marijuana legalization or other drugs, you've got William F. Buckley. Governor Rick Perry has come out in favor of de decriminalization. Pat Robertson, Bill O'Reilly, Sean Hannity, even Newt Gingrich and Ken Cuccinelli have questioned the war on drugs. Libertarians and social conservatives can absolutely work together if we realize that we're both trying to limit the scope of government when it comes to the freedom to associate and act as we want. Thanks so much. Matt Spaulding, at, at some point, the notion of we the people with a common moral philosophy tends to get dissipated in the autonomous approach to life and principle that defines libertarianism. At what point does the common philosophy underlying the Constitution begin to dissipate to the point where we are no longer we, the people? Right. Well, I think it begins with the founder's understanding of the word liberty. They chose the word liberty, which is a Latin word, rather than freedom, which is a Germanic word, precisely because they meant freedom appropriate for man. Uh, they understood liberty to be under the laws of nature and nature's God. Uh, it didn't mean license. So in this, it required a, a, a certain unity and agreement about certain common precepts of how we govern ourselves. 
Uh, we want to have as much freedom as possible. We want to have the freedom to choose. I precisely agree with that. But we must agree first and foremost on certain precepts according to which we recognize each other's humanity. We believe that all men are created equal, not unequal. We believe that all have a right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, which includes your right to property, but also your religious liberty if you're a religious believer in things that, are, that the government is opposing upon you. Those things have to be an underlying core for this liberty to exist in the first place. And that really was the founders' idea of liberty, and I think that's what we want to get back to. Matt, uh, your book, uh, Declaration of Independence, seems to militate against that notion of shared values and commonality. Your book speaks a lot about li living interesting lives as far away from politics as possible. In fact, in your book, there's a bit of a rage against the system attitude in it. And how do you respond to what uh, Matt, Matt Spaulding has just said? I have faith in American culture. I have faith in You're the, the American. One. Yeah, there's got to be one of us left. Uh, <laughs> you know, I, I remember going on uh, Wisconsin Public Radio in Madison, Wisconsin, like in October 2008, right after the TARP freakout and the uh, bipartisan establishments in Washington telling us that in order to be good people, we had to support an open-ended check and bailout to everyone who'd made a mistake in the last 20 years. And, uh, and the House of Representatives voted against it. And I was the guy who was going to go be the patsy on Madison, Wisconsin public, public radio to talk about why bailouts are bad. And we took calls for an hour. And for an entire hour, Madison, Wisconsin people were telling me, bailouts are morally wrong. This is America. If you take a gamble, you win, you lose. You shouldn't have the government uh, bail you out. That said to me more about faith in some kind of bedrock American notion of free markets, of capitalism, of personal responsibility, uh, if it can survive even our entire political establishment class freaking out, totally losing faith. When George W. Bush got in front of the country and said, normally I have faith in free markets and capitalism, but we knew that we were going to be in for a bad political era, and we are in one, but I have faith that these, that these creed, this muscle memory of the American experiment will persevere, and I think it perseveres better the further away we go from political tribal membership, right? You know, when you can start thinking for yourself and focusing on individual issues and finding allies where they are on the issues that you care about, putting your arm around them and saying, let's go fight here, and then saying, okay, we don't have to agree about everything else. I think that's a normal pro procession of where America is going, and I'm ec ecstatic about it. All right, we have a question from the audience. We Mike Medved, I will uh, pass it along to you. Will political conservatives ever ease up on those social issues, or do we have to wait for our generation to run government? Uh, okay, it's, it's not a question of easing up on social issues, and it's not really even a question about arguing about the philosophy of libertarianism versus social conservatism or Burkean conservatism, or however you want to define it. Because right now, we have a common foe. We have a common danger. The Battle of Gettysburg, the uh, federal line up on the ridge, wasn't arguing between Republicans and Democrats, and they were both up there. There, there were uh, 15,000 Confederates coming up the ridge, and you had to deal with it. Right now, the forces of big government are on the march. And, and one thing that conservatives and libertarians have in common is resisting it. The way to resist is to acknowledge the validity of libertarian means and conservative goals. And let me give you an example, because it's one of those areas where on one of the social issues that conservatives care about most, we have had great success using libertarian means that I would imagine everyone on this panel could support. The issue is abortion. Now, one of the things the pro-life movement has achieved without changing law, without changing government, what the pro-life movement has achieved is cutting the level of abortion in the United States to its lowest point in 30 years. How? <laughs> By preaching and teaching and reaching people and convincing more people. And this is one of the only social issues in which the support for a conservative position, a pro-life position, which I share emphatically, that support is higher among young people than among codgers like us. And, and really, that is a very important achievement. It was achieved not by legislative means, not by government force, but by argument and persuasion. Libertarian means 
for a conservative goal. Let me say one other thing quickly about one of the other big issues that purportedly divides us that shouldn't. Right now, the key issue regarding marriage is not the definition of marriage anymore. It is now an issue of religious liberty. And I don't believe there's a libertarian in this hall today who believes that, well, for instance, that the government has a right or a need to order a group of elderly Catholic nuns in Colorado to ensure their employees for birth control. That is big government run amok. And by the same token, we right now have a great believer not, belief not only in religious conscience and the rights of religious conscience when it comes to marriage, but a great belief in federalism. The idea that New York and California may have legitimated or recognized or decided that those states should sponsor gay marriage doesn't mean that Texas should be compelled by overreaching courts or anyone else to sponsor and legitimate gay marriage. And that belief in federalism, again, should unite libertarians and should unite conservatives in passionate agreement, not in any kind of squabble. Well, thank you. Alexander, if Michael is right, if the marriage issue is no longer a marriage issue, if it's about religious liberty, that, liberty, that is to say, rights of conscience, where, do, where does libertarianism come down in terms of supporting our right to be conscientious objectors, so to speak. So I largely agree with what you just said. The issue here is religious liberty, but the kind of religious liberty that has been infringed upon for decades over in recent memory has been the liberty of those religious institutions and practices that support same-sex marriage. The government has prohibited them from engaging in the religion and the religious practices that they want. Where? Where? No prohibition. There has never been a state in this country that has ever banned gay marriage. That's a liberal lie. Defining there's marriage is between... There's state-sponsored discrimination against various associations between individuals. We're talking about the denial of basic rights and privileges of individuals in committed relationships. The only difference being their sexual orientation. This okay. is the civil rights issue of the 21st century. Uh, okay, so I, the, the, I, the problem... I guess the, you're, you're saying no, that those of us who uphold the traditional definition of marriage as religious, uh, religious liberty issue, you're not with us on that. As an issue, I'll jump in for Alex here. Uh, I don't want any baker, <laughs> any photographer to be told they have to work with someone because they're gay. For crying out loud. Amen. People should have the right. It's, it is not 1964. It is not 1864. We live in a country now where if you want to openly discriminate against whoever you want in your, in your business life, and we actually have a broad right to discrimination in this country, so congratulations for us. But the thing is that we don't exercise it because we're a decent people. We, we don't need the government. You know, we talk a lot about uh, government granting license or not. We, we, morality is not dictated by the government. It's dictated by each individual and their conscience, and then there's a community effect. If someone wants to be openly discriminatory in their policies, they're going to open themselves up to the free market, punishing them or rewarding them as necessary. Tom, Tom could I, could I wait, just wait, 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 Hold on. Wait. I think this is what gets back to the, the, the precepts under which we govern ourselves question, right? We, we agree that all men are created equal. We all commonly accept this idea. Maybe we don't agree with that. We have to have those kinds of agreements to have a civilized society. That's the basis of free government and constitution. I think the most... The problem you have here with this particular issue is that the question of marriage does cut to the nature of things, which is the grounding for precisely the liberty you wish to defend. And if you don't recognize the fact that the government needs to protect those who have religious liberty objections to this fundamental question, then you're giving up your liberty because now government has the right to step in and define those things for you. And I guarantee you, that's what they're going to do. And we're going to see the mass, massive expansion of the state unlike ever before. Libertarians right now should how, be protecting religious liberty first and foremost how is on the front lines. How is it violating your liberty as a private, presumably heterosexual man who's in a married relationship, as I am, how does it infringe in your sense of conscience if someone in your state, for example, has a marriage that, a gay couple has a marriage that is recognized by the state? How does that violate your liberty? The question is whether the state has an obligation to recognize marriage in the first place, and if so, on what grounds? And the interest of the state 
constitutionally and historically is because of those children that are produced by that marriage. Now, we can argue about being tolerant and we can argue about allowing people to have as much uh, a free lifestyle as they want to, but the only reason we're having this debate here is because we're concerned about the future of, of the future citizens that are going to be produced in this, in this country. But the, th the other point I'm making here is that even if we disagree, which we clearly do, we have an agreement and we must have an agreement on religious liberty. There is a profound, deep, and moral and religious objection to redefining marriage. Giving that power to the state and encouraging judges to do that is a destruction of the very liberty we wish to defend. But you're using the government, the state, to protect morality as you see it, which is different than my morality. I'm just, so I'm just suggesting that the government should needs to recognize in nature something that pre-exists government. I'm not using the state at all. I'm saying it's like gravity. If they're going to recognize marriage at all, this is the definition of the thing because no other definition makes sense as marriage. It might make sense as a private contract. That's a different matter. But if the reason we're here is to protect marriage, it's because of this particular type of institution, social private institution, which forms the character of our citizens. That's key to the future of liberty. I would just say quickly in, on the children issue, and I share your concern for children, I think one of the boons to our system is that a whole lot of children in this country no longer live in lousy foster homes and have been adopted by loving gay couples in opposition to social conservatives who oppose us at every step. It's, it's better than the ravages of the welfare state. Yeah. But it's clearly not the thing we wish to encourage. The question is, what do we want to encourage? What is the good thing here? Well, it, it, again, th I think that the, the way that we find common ground and find the common road forward is conservative goals and libertarian means. In other words, I would assume that we all share goals in stable, long-term, loving families raising children. And as far as possible, because this is the nature of all family law, I mean, basically, in the country that it is the optimal situation for children to be raised by their biological parents. And once you agree on that, then you proceed with libertarian means. I don't, I don't think that there are a lot of social conservatives who are looking to undo right now the 15 states that have decided they want to sponsor gay marriage, at least not those states where that sponsorship was decided legislatively or through initiative. In other words, in Minnesota, they voted for it. Um, they voted for it in my state of Washington. And I don't see a lot of social conservatives saying that this should be undone by some kind of governmental force. And recognizing that libertarian means minimizing the amount of governmental interference in our lives as far as possible, combined with conservative goals, which is healthy communities, strong families, decent values, promoting virtue, not just liberty. That, it seems to me, is the basis for the modern conservative. But really quick, there are 35 more states to go, and I think that's what the questioner was actually targeting, the fact that there are still places that are trying to recognize same-sex marriage in order to allow for the religious liberty of those people who want to have a marriage you, that's recognized by the state. Do you think that those places should be forced by federal action, or do you believe that each state should be able to decide its own definition of marriage? I believe the 13th Amendment incorporates the Bill of Rights to all states, and that the freedom of association through marriage you're, you're is a, a big government right, as, as the Supreme Court <laughs> yeah, has no. said in Loving v. Virginia. We've dealt with this very same issue when it came to interracial marriage, and it's now a we're dealing it's a different with question. It's a different question. The, the fact of one's color of one's skin is, a, is, is a, a coincidence, right? It has nothing to do with your character. Right? The difference between a male and a female is something that is self-evident and obvious that we need to deal with, and we can't shut it aside, and we can't turn it over to judges to tell us what to do. And if, I, I'm not saying that that's part of the human condition. Part of liberty is figuring out how do we as humans who disagree and have deep passions and beliefs get along and govern ourselves. That's why we have constitutionalism, to try to figure out how we do this. And, we and, don't and, force and, other people to, to, to live the way you want to live. And I'm suggesting to you that what the federal government is doing now, rapidly because of judges, is going to upend every social institution of this country. And that kind of revolutionary change is something that conservatives, libertarians, that we should all be opposed to because it's going to destroy this country. And, and, and this, this goes to just to, to I, I am actually surprised, really surprised to hear you take the position you do. Because as a libertarian, you are taking a position that nine unelected judges should impose their will and their judgment 
on the sovereign states, all 50 sovereign states, and the citizens therein in terms of something as fundamental to society as the definition of family and the definition of marriage. And that, it seems to me, is an arrogation of power away from the people that is totally contrary to libertarian ideology. Hey, uh, Matt, in your book, Declaration of Independence, you make an interesting statement. You say that libertarianism, you see in, politically, is a permanent, non-governing minority. But at some point, Matt, doesn't, don't libertarians have to take over to become a majority to make sure that all of us benefit from that? Look, we're, you know, we're about 15% of the country, if you look at things general, generously. Uh, so we're not going to take over anything, and you're probably all happier uh, for that. If you've ever been in a room full of libertarians, you'll know exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, no, we uh, we operate in a margin where we're. we're I, I'm saying we. You know, I, I shouldn't say we. The, you know, my entire readership of my magazine hates it if I even say we for you know the reason magazine, let alone libertarianism. Um, but uh, libertarians are perpetually disappointed by the activities of both major parties for various reasons. Sometimes it's because the parties have failed to live up to their own best ideals, which I think uh, many people in this room can agree took place between the years 2003 and 2007, for example, when we had what was supposed to be, according to David Brooks, a permanent Republican majority. Uh, you know, it was gonna last forever. Uh, and they boosted the size and scope of government in ways that is obscene and that a lot of people rightly object to when Barack Obama has mimicked it. So the question for libertarians, I think, what we're, what we're going to see is, is more of what I was referring to before of ad hoc sort of swarms into issues where we can find coalition partners. This room was packed out earlier, I hope that many of you were here, talking about Rick Perry and Bernie Carrick and other people's really, really interesting work on reforming a criminal justice system that has incarcerated two million plus Americans. That's an amazing thing that has happened. It's happened from the bottom up. You know, finally some politicians started noticing, including many conservatives, leading on this issue. This is a great thing. I will put my, I will embrace Rick Perry, kiss him on both cheeks and say thank you for leading on this issue. And if there's a Democratic governor who wants to do the same thing, I will do that too. A lot of the best action in American politics and society, whether it is from my point of view, not necessarily yours, in reforming the drug war system, and uh, marijuana, also in homeschooling, in a lot of different areas of uh, American life, what the action is outside of the system and away from politicians because politicians are terrified to lead. So it's Americans and it's flowing permanently into these little coalitions to actually break these stupid log jams that both parties have contributed to. Alexander, let me uh, bring you into this political discussion. Uh, 2016 looms, but we're not going to get away from politics. Probably there will be a very strong Libertarian Party candidate running for president who probably doesn't have much of a chance to be elected. On the other hand, there may well be a barely tolerable Republican Party candidate <laughs> who may have a better chance. Who will you support? It's very early to start saying who that wants <laughs> to support. But I mean, that's a great right question for everybody. <laughs> but which kind of candidate would you guide people toward? I'm going to guide people towards what whoever is the most libertarian that has the most likely chance of getting elected, and that might be someone in the Libertarian Party, it might be a Republican. <laughs> there might even be good Democrats, probably not at the presidential level, but at the local and state level who have libertarian philosophies that libertarian voters should be happy to vote for, and they will be. And that's why I think this conversation is really important. One of the big things that divides libertarians and conservatives right now are these social issues. And there's a question as to whether libertarians should maintain the alliance with conservatism that's been around for a long time, or if we should form other alliances, or if we should develop our own effort. And we need to figure out if there's a way for us to work together or not. I think there is, but we need some give on both sides. Well, th thanks so much. Uh, one, a question from the audience here. Back to my original point. Why have government define marriage at all? That is in the Re Libertarian Party platform. Uh, Michael? Michael? The, the government defines marriage because ultimately when marriages break apart and there are children in the marriage, a government is inevitably involved. How else do you settle who gets custody of children, where the children will live, who's going to be responsible for supporting the children? And even marriage is a contractual relationship. Marriage is not a private relationship. 
we are just planning, my wife and I are planning our son's wedding, and it's not private at all. <laughs> there are lots of people involved, and there are lots of legalities. In Jewish tradition, it is a contractual relationship. And a contractual relationships in our society are enforced and arbitrated by the government. And, and what I think is fascinating here is uh, the, the notion that particularly with, with gay adoption, which, by the way, I've supported for a long time, because I do believe that a loving, stable, gay couple is a much better place to put a child uh, than with either a single father or a single mother or in some kind of institution. And I think that conservatives, most conservatives, can acknowledge that. But, but having, 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 said, having said that, if you have gay adoption and the couple breaks apart, it obviously has to be a governmental matter. It's going to come before a court. And courts need to be governed by legalities. Um, the libertarians, for the libertarians, what do you guys do with Matt Spaulding, who wrote in his book, quote, in a nation of limited government, religion is the greatest source of the virtue and moral character required for self-rule. Does that fly in the face of the autonomy that's inherent in libertarianism? Not for me. I mean, that very well might be true. I'm, I, I don't know. And if it's true, I'm totally happy with it. I mean, this one of the geniuses of the American system is that we not only allowed, had some separation between church and state, but we allowed for religious competition. You know, I, my wife Amen. is French, and the France is a dominant Catholic country, uh, and they had a different idea about, uh, you know, how to build their republic than not. And it's amazing to me, and it's amazing to them to see how the, the amount of religious devotion in this country and the amazing good works that churches do in this country, which is totally not replicated anywhere else in Europe, which has a much different, a much different approach towards these issues. So our free, you know, free market in religion, to use a term that might sound crass, um, I think has been a wonderful thing. Ch churches are integral, I don't know how integral, but they're integral to how communities get built and how uh, America maintains itself. Good, so, sure. so, so I'm not kicked off the island. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, there's, there's... I, 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 the, the, my point here is, you know, two, all, we, we're having two different conversations. We're getting mixed up. One is a political conversation about how to fight through existing policies right here and now. But the broader question is more of this philosophical question. And, and there, I think we, we misunderstand it when we start talking about the various isms we fall into, whether it's libertarian, conservatism, or whatever it might be. The, the true fusion, the higher fusion, the, the true uh, fusion of Western civilization is in what the founders did themselves, not just because they're ours, but because of what they accomplished, namely bringing all these things together, a very strong moral backbone and a moral understanding of the, of the grounds for liberty with freedom in a very powerful way through the Constitution. That's the source of the fusion, and rather than bickering, we will continue to bicker over policies until, the, uh, until night comes, I suppose. But it, we should continue to focus on why that agreement, that thing which is the, created the greatest freedom on the face of the earth, right? That's the fusion. And that allows for liberty, but protects religious liberty for, uh, uh, as well in a very powerful way. And that's our model for figuring well, out. Well, wait a minute, though. Matt Welch has written in his book, quote, one size fits all colors are fading. Americans are becoming more individualized, not just with their personal choices, but with their ideologies and politics. Does that give you concern for the future? That's, uh, no, it, it doesn't, right? I mean, if one size fits all, I mean, that's progressive liberalism, the, the expansion of state. I mean, there's complete agreement on that question. There's also increasing diversity in society, partially because of technology, which I, uh, which I think is true. But remember, diversity in the diversity of opinions, including religious opinions, was exactly James Madison's argument about the Constitution. But that diversity, he also recognized, as did Jefferson and Washington and all the other founders, is based upon a unity, a philosophical unity, which they said was self-evident, a moral claim. These things have to go together. You can't have a defense of liberty in a practical sense without first recognizing that we recognize a moral precept that cannot be denied, that all men are created equal. And that's a fundamental truth that gives rise to life 
liberty and the pursuit of happiness. I think a, a major departure point, and I agree most of that, is, is that simply I have faith that that exists in America, that it's written into our DNA through the Constitution, through our cultural patterns, it's transmitted. I have faith that that's going to exist. I don't worry that this country is going to be destroyed on that access at all. I, 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 would, I would disagree with you, because particularly when you have government, and this is big government again, promoting multiculturalism, which is the opposite of Americanization, the idea of not e pluribus unum, not out of many one, but out of one many, then it's government once again taking a hugely destructive role. And I, I don't believe that government has to force people into anything but to encourage the idea that we are one nation and one culture and we share common precepts and common responsibilities, it seems to me is, is fundamental to a flourishing republic. I, think, I just think the culture takes care of that itself. We don't need go government to, in a Teddy Roosevelt-style okay, yes, but, but spasm, then, right, tell us that right. we have to be Americans in right, this one right. way. But, Fine, but, agreed, but, but we, you we do have the, to the pull back the... from government-sponsored right. multiculturalism and government-sanctioned. I mean, look, I... I, I do not believe that we should outlaw the speaking of any language other than English. But it seems to me absurd and destructive to the Republic that we now print ballots in 70 languages. I mean, if people are going to vote in the United States, they should be able to share a common language. Wait, I'm confused. Weren't you, weren't you just saying that we needed to recognize that the one comes from the many rather than the many comes from the one? Shouldn't that be an embrace of decentralization and diversity? No, no, US? that that no. is that is an embrace of that's, the that's, idea that, that if you want to be mistake, part of the recall. one, you share something in common with your neighbor, which is the ability to communicate with them. I mean, the, 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 the problem here is is, is 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 I think libertarianism is too defensive in the sense that it assumes that whenever we talk about any unity, it means absolute unity, which we object to as, as well. But the question is, can we have any unity? anything upon which we agree. Very good. And, and the point is, we can't have freedom, right? Look at history before 1776. There was no freedom in the world that anywhere, anywhere came near what the Americans accomplished. Why? Because it was either run by absolutism and kings and absolute rulers, or it was complete and utter anarchy. What the Americans said is that no, we agree on certain things, certain things that are unalienable, right? And on the basis of that, government should be based on consent. Right? Those are the two sides of the coin, and they follow like night and day. And when you, when you deny one of them, the other one collapses. And that's what we're uh, threatened with happening here, I think. Alexander, do you think that we're destined to remain in a two-party system, or do you see a breaking up and realignment on a big scale coming in the future? I think there are a lot of things in the political system in the United States that prevent a third party from really taking a significant role in that system. But what I think we're going to see, and Political Economy 101 teaches us, is that if demographic trends change over time, political parties and politicians will have to adopt new positions in order to get elected, which is what they exist for. And so the rising libertarian nature of today's youth does mean that I expect the Republican Party to become more libertarian in order to get more elected. I also expect the Democratic Party to become more libertarian in order to try and appeal to young voters. And I think we're gonna see major policy reforms over the next 10 to 20 years in consequence of that. If, if I can, I, I actually agree with you completely. And, and uh, I do wanna take the opportunity. I, I have become somewhat notorious and uh, been widely criticized uh, by the Libertarian Party, that's large L, Libertarian Party, as an institution for always referring to them on my radio show as the Losertarian Party, and as not a party, but as a quasi-religious death cult. And, um, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and once, once that death cult uh, goes on to, to finish the Kool-Aid, and actually joins the American political system by participating in one of our two viable political parties, it can make huge contributions by emphasizing the proper small government, minimized government, libertarian means to achieving either the goals that conservatives favor or the goals that liberals favor. I would just like to point out in, in opposition to that, that probably, as George Will said, the single most interesting thing happening in American politics right now is basically what's happening in this room. Not necessarily this debate, but just the debate that's happening on a lot of different fronts within the Republican Party, right. within conservatism. The Tea Party, for my money, has been the single most interesting new phenomenon in American politics. Absolutely. And 
you crazy hooters over there, uh, you know that part of the reason that that happened was that the Tea Party said, no, we're not going to stay on the reservation. We're not going to join forever and be counted on forever to reliably vote forever for your damn candidates. We want candidates who stand up for the values that we have that have not been represented. And so when they said, yeah, we'll lose, we'll nominate Christine O'Donnell, bring it on, who cares? When they said that, they announced to Karl Rove and the political establishment in Washington that, look, values matter more than pretty candidates, than people that you want to nominate, and we're going to change the type of Republican that goes to Washington. We have new Republicans in Washington because precisely people said, I'm going to be a, more of a free agent politically. I'm going to use independence as a weapon. And so now we have interesting people like Rand Paul, like Justin Amash, who are inconceivable in American politics word. in 2009. I think that's a great thing. Thank you. Matthew Spaulding, last I, word to you. I, I was just going to say, you know, at, at, at Hillsdale, we make all of our students actually learn something about America and the Constitution. Uh, <laughs> and, and one of the things we ask them when they come to school, when they come and I ask my students what kind of conservative you are, then they say, oh, I'm a libertarian, I'm a, I'm a traditionalist, I'm a neocon, a theocon, a paleocon, you name it. That's the wrong question. That immediately divides us, that immediately points to our differences. The question is, what do we wish to conserve? And that is American liberty. And, and, and this country is, 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 is the most powerful force for liberty in the face of the earth. And I'm telling you, we are on the verge of losing that country. And if we don't come together in a very powerful way, in the way the founders did, we are going to lose it. And we shouldn't be an instrument of losing it. But if we come together, we win. Because we have the ideas, and we are the, we are the group of ideas, and we have the truth. So well thank well you. said. We're out of time. Please express your Amen. appreciation. Yeah. It's a great, great, great panel. panel. Thank you. Great panel. Great panel. Great panel. Great panel. Thank you.